I want to like struggle and grind and have all the pressure. I'm gonna take the last shot uh, in the game always, every time. You know, it, it makes me simpatico with you know Stefan's you know idol Kobe, the Black Mamba, who's on this amazing. Like it was funny. I was working out this morning and I, I had to do like some cardio stuff that was hard for me. So I'm like, Mike, put on TV so I can watch Sports Center and not think about what we're actually doing. And I caught the clip of like the way Kobe last night in Philadelphia. And I was like, you know, and I said to Mike, I said, you know what's so awesome about sports is if you time it right and you know it, you can have this kind of farewell tour. So I've been thinking about my farewell entrepreneur tour. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. I'm gonna be like 89, 97, and be like, hey, <laughs> you know. But but I, you know, I, I think that, I don't even remember the question. I just wanted to talk about Kobe's farewell tell. What was this again? Um, oh, being lonely. Look, I, the reason I brought up Kobe is Kobe wants to take the last shot. Winners want to take the last shot. You want to take the high with the low. When you are truly an A, an actual purebred entrepreneur, you don't know anything else than getting the accolades or getting shit on when you don't execute. Actually, for the first, you know, it's really interesting. I had a hundredth of a second because I'm concerned about macroeconomic climates for a hundredth of a second yesterday, which is unheard of for me, I was like, ooh, what if like Vayner took a step back and I had to deal with like people being like, oh, you, you, you're not running this business well or what's going on? Like, it was so funny. I thought of it for a hundredth of a second and then I got so happy. I got so happy because I quickly thought about the second chess move, which was, for whatever reason, if a, you know, a couple of our clients, as you know, are starting to become very big clients and I don't like them being too much a percentage of my business because they can go away the next day. I don't like that. So that maybe is why it popped up in my mind. Or I also think we're in a bubbly kind of world. You've got terror activity, you got Wall Street being too bubbly for a long period of time. Anything can happen, things can happen. And so it was funny for me when I thought about it because that's my job, I'm lonely at the top, I have to worry about everything and make sure I'm hedged and ready and mentally prepared for anything that could go wrong. And then I got excited about the second chess move which was the thing I live for which was the I told you so when the doubters came in and said, oh why did you, you misplayed it. You didn't think social wasn't as big as you thought. You didn't see this coming. Then being able to navigate through those choppy waters. I often talk about being a wartime general over a peacetime general. Anybody can look good. Anybody who's watching or listening to this show can be an entrepreneur right now because shit is good. When it gets tough. When there's not people throwing around $25,000 investment. When, when you can't put up your idea on Kickstarter and everybody wants to give you 100 bucks because the economy's crap and they need their 100 bucks, that's when the cream rises. And so for me, the way I deal with it, I, the way I deal with it is, there is no dealing with it. It is my DNA. It is my only known gear. I don't even understand that damn question. Now, I recognize it to take myself out of the equation and try to answer for the whole. Look, you gotta put things in perspective. You know, if you want the accolades, if you have the audacity to want to be somebody that is successful, make, do you, do you, if you want the, let's play the data. If you want the audacity to be a millionaire, which is by percentage, almost impossible. There's very few of them. If you really break down, like, let's play some math here. Let's keep it, let's keep it unemotional. Let's keep it, if you want the audacity to be in the top, in the top 1% of Americans who are, is a, which is a very rich company, company, country, probably company too, country, are people in the hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in revenue, not millions. So we're talking about a very small group of people that are able to get to this extreme level of success in business. And we can have shows about, you know, actually, you know what? Oh, I was gonna point at India. Danielle, tell India, when you do a show about like life and not business stuff, but like in the context of business, like life happiness, like there's a million ways and we ranted on it the other day. But if you want the audacity to be a millionaire, to be successful, to write books, if you want the audacity, don't you understand the crap that comes along with that? Like I wanted the audacity to be in shape. It's come with a lot of crap. It's been a lot of work. I'm 18 months in and I'm like, I, I said this the other day, I'm not, on my fitness video, I'm not sure I would do this if I saw what I would look like 18 months later. Meaning, I'd look a lot better, but damn it, I would've been like, really? For every single day, for 18 months? To wake up at four in the morning? You know, like I would be like, oh, you know. So, <laughs> you deal with it because it's a very small price to pay for all the phenomenal stuff that you headline read and you aspire to and you dream for. The problem is most of you don't want to eat that shit to get there. Why is EQ so important? Because I think it's real life. You know, I think a lot of things that were taught around business, business school are uh, the hard skills, they matter. You need to know how to balance a checkbook. <laughs> You need to know how to staff and models and all that. It's very important, but at the end of the day, 
I really think business is run by people, with people, for people, and humanity and and the things that trigger people positively and negatively are incredibly important and leadership uh, capabilities that find the balance between actually executing something because business is a competitive world um, and uh, and um, you know and and then you know actually having the humanity to make those things happen matters mm -hmm. now you mentioned like you said it's not taught in business school so how do you go about figuring out or, or how much eq somebody has and are there certain roles that are better for high eq people versus low eq people um i think uh I think every role is important. I actually think the CEO is the number one person you'd like to have EQ because if she or he doesn't, they're vulnerable. You know, I th there's no really way to measure. It's not like we have a test, like a COVID test or an SAT where you can really get that answer. I think um, I'm a big fan of trying to get real feedback from human beings that interact with human beings. You know, so when I'm making decisions on hiring, I try to see if I can find a person or two that's close to that person, that doesn't have a horse in the race, that's worked with them in the past, the real, real. Um, and then you just observe it when they work for you. You know, the way I pick managers are the ones who have, you know, these emotional intelligence skills. But, you know, listen, there's some very aggressive emotional intelligence skills that matter. Ambition matters. For example, you know, one of the, traits I talk about in the book is ambition. Ambition matters. Like somebody that's hungry is going to achieve more. It's just that, you know, ambition over passiveness is a factor in winning, but, but so is accountability. So you have ambitious people who don't like accountability. They like to blame everybody else. They like fingers, not thumbs. Um, so some of these skills kind of uh, contrast with each other. Yeah, I think so. Like, you know, to me being content and being in, like my life, wild levels of complacent. I wouldn't call it complacency, I call it content. I'm incredibly grateful. But actually that's the one I use in the book. Gratitude and ambition could seem as a contradiction. I'm so grateful for everything I have and don't have any expectations. No entitlement to more, but have incredible drive for more, right? Yep. So I think, yes, yeah, I do think, you know, uh, kindness, and empathy confuse people. I laugh when people are confused by that, right? Um, curiosity is actually a heavy, and humility, two things I talk a lot about, being curious and being humble. But at the same token, conviction. So I'm incredibly curious, but I have wild conviction. You know, humility is my ultimate pillar of why I think I'm here today and being honored to interview with you and all the good things that are happening to me. But I have crazy conviction. Once I believe something, because I've tested and learned it, I was curious. So I, I think these things do battle against each other. Um, you know, patience and tenacity are two of the ingredients I talk about all the time. Yeah. Imagine being equally patient and tenacious. Patience for me is a macro, tenacity is a micro. Mm -hmm. Right? So you have, you have to be tenacious in the task at hand but patient in the overall mission. And I think people struggle with the levels. They, they struggle with the macro micro. Gotcha, so you may have one level of one and then a lower level of the other and it kind of works together. That's right, and, and one may be something about life and another might be the project at hand. Gotcha. So um, you refer to empathy as the Swiss army knife of business tools that could be used to motivate employees, close sales, create new products, deliver world-class service. How should one employ empathy both in dealing with their customers, but also within their organizations? Well, to me, it's funny. I have more, I have more empathy for my employees than I do for my customers. Mm -hmm. And I have more empathy for my customers' customers than I do for my customers. <laughs> you know, I, I think people have the rankings wrong. I go employee, customer of comps. This is at Boehner because we're B2B. Employee, customer of customer, like the customers of Budweiser. Mm -hmm. And then the client. Most places are client, client, client. And I think that hurts them. 
So for me, that's how I think about it. And um, I'm just incredibly passionate about it. I think that if you care and know what your employee cares about, you can create a system that allows them to be happy and succeed. Every year I read Marcus Aurelius Meditations. And it just so happened that the part I got up to today, he wrote, Patient, uh, practice really hearing what people say. Do your best to get inside their mind. So empathy, the value of empathy has been around for a thousand, more than a thousand years. So it's just interesting how, and listening is such an important part of it, listening and observing. Um, it's just so damn obvious. <laughs> Uh, but we don't talk about it in business, mm -hmm. right? Even right now, I just had to reply to somebody whose mother is sick that works for me. That was what I was just doing on my phone right now. I'm in the middle of this interview. I don't want to be, I don't want to be not paying attention to this, but I've been worrying about this employee. And like, I didn't even want it to wait for a second. I want him to feel my being in it. Mm -hmm. Even at the ability of like having somebody see this and be like, oh, why is Gary not paying attention for a second? <laughs> so I'm willing to take the casualty be the front of it and be judged on that so I can do what I just did. And, and, and what that is, that, that was so meta, but that was an example of the reality of it all. Either you're religious about this, emotional intelligence, or you're not. Either you're about your employees or you're not. Either you realize that your employees, your customers, the business, and then you, the entrepreneur, is fourth and too many people are, put themselves first. They want to get a boat or a house or a new, yeah. you know, and, and that hurts people.